Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Coming up on today's show, we'll tell you what the GOP has done to rebrand itself one year after the release of their disastrous autopsy report. And we'll talk about why Hillary Clinton might not be the perfect choice for the Democrats in 2016. Also, we'll explain why investing in infrastructure could solve a lot of America's economic problems. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, just remember, you've stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> America's infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, and buildings are falling apart. Need $2.2 trillion just to make a dent in the infrastructure problem. Uh, investing in real, rebuilding this country is going to solve a lot of economic problems. And I have uh, Howard Nations with me to talk about how that's going to happen. Howard, the new report is that corporate America is now, sp is now sending $3 trillion dollars uh, worth of worth of money that should be they should be paying taxes on that they're shipping that offshore. Now these are the same corporations who count on our military, they count on our roads, they to deliver their pro product, our, our streets. They they count on our police departments, on our fire departments, the infrastructure that taxpayers pay for. These corporations benefit hugely from, but they don't want to pay taxes. They want to keep their money offshore, and as a result, our in, our infrastructure is crumbling, just falling apart. By every study that I that I've been able to see in the last uh, ten years, we're not responding, are we? Not a bit, Mike. As a matter of fact, this failure to invest in infrastructure is a perfect example of the consequences of political gridlock in America. We know historically that investing in infrastructure gives us long-term economic growth, it creates jobs, it grows the economy, and it lowers cost of doing business for business at every level. We have to upgrade roads, bridges, and put people to work. The people that are working spend money as middle-class incomes, which expands the uh, business consumer base. But they fail, to, they fail to pass this with the American Jobs Act. It's just totally outrageous. Well, interesting, uh, this, it, this, the, the material you're talking about, there's part of it at least came from the Center of American Progress. They right. did a great report on it. And they say that, that the businesses, they're quick to look to profits, but they're, they're so short-sighted in understanding that they can actually expand their profits by building infrastructure because of the, the domino effect that when you put a dollar into into the economy, the, the, it's geometrically grows for small businesses. But you have big business like the Chamber of Commerce, who is siding up with only, you know, historically has only sided up with a small part of the business community. Uh, to tell me where this is going to go uh, as far as reinvestment. What can we do to reinvest money that actually moves into the pocket of business and American consumers by, by simply building our infrastructure? Well, we learned a lesson from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, where the Department of Transportation invested in infrastructure and created or saved 1.1 million jobs in construction and 400,000 jobs in manufacturing in, by March of 2011. Most of those new jobs were created in the private sector. Uh, this, the effect of it was improving drinking and wastewater systems, repairing bridges, repairing roads, rehabilitating airports and shipyards. An economic study showed that 12.3 jobs per $100,000 spent. Now, the Department of Transportation and Department of Energy spent $24.7 billion by September of 2010, which created or saved more than 3 million jobs. That's just historically a fact, and we see the value of, of infrastructure investing. But they're refusing to do any more of it. That one got through, but the American Jobs Act failed. Well, I think this this story, this report that came from the Center for American Progress, they I mean that's where you're getting this material. They right. followed this point by point and they substantiate what you're talking about here and that is we we miss the idea. See what we've been talking about is austerity. 
in the U.S. We can't we can't afford to build bridges. We can't afford to build roads. Right. I was just in Virginia this past week. Have you driven through Virginia lately? Have you driven through the potholes and the the the, the destruction of the roads is almost overwhelming. Why? Because government there won't put any money into infrastructure. They don't get it to say that if a person builds a bridge, you have independent contractors all over that area where the bridge is being built in that state that are making money. And then they're taking that money and they're spending it at the local businesses in their neighborhoods. I don't know what it is that American business can't seem to understand, but you had American business really fighting this until the U.S. Chamber of Commerce joined up with the AFL-CIO and said, look, maybe we were just stupid. Maybe we were just wrong. Maybe those 19 companies that give us all the money, talking about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, those 19 businesses that we support all the time, maybe we need to look beyond those 19 businesses and look for mom and pop businesses so we can help them do better. Isn't that what happened here? It is what happened. And what they fail to see is that the highest multiplier effect of all the physical stimulus policies that you can have in government is infrastructure investment. The economist Mark Zandi said, of every dollar of government spending, you get a $1.44% boost in the economy. A dollar of tax rebate, which is all about Republicans, you get a $1.22 boost in the economy. Before the recession, a billion dollars invested created 18,000 new jobs, direct jobs, supplier jobs, and offered paycheck boost to local economy. After the recession, the Transportation Department, by contrast, as opposed to 18,000 new jobs, when transportation put a billion dollars in the federal highway system, they created 30,000 new jobs, 10,000 in construction, 5,000 in supporting industries, and 15,000 in induced employment. So the empirical data is there. Infrastructure creates jobs, increases production of small, medium, and large companies, and provides the highway and the power grids and water that businesses rely on. Well, yeah, again, the, the, you're, this, this is right here in black and white. This, this Center for American Progress report, don't you think that everybody listening to this should, should find that report, Center for American Progress, and go online. We'll put it online right here on, on Ring of Fire. They can take that and they can send it to their senators. They can send it to their congressmen and say, look, what in the hell is it that you don't understand? Why do you keep talking austerity? When you're, and why do you keep talking about corporate welfare where you're giving gazillions of dollars to corporations and subsidies? You're letting them bank off offshore. They're keeping three trillion dollars offshore. You're not. There, there's no downside. And those same corporations are using our streets. They're using our bridges. Our military is keeping them safe, protecting them so they can do business overseas. It's allowing those corporations to go and, you know, ba basically rape and pillage places like South America and South Africa, take the natural resources for what they want. The military allows them to do that, but they don't want to pay any money. You see, they, they, their, their opportunity, their, 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 mo their position is, gee whiz, we're already paying too much taxes, which is a lie. Most of them don't even pay taxes. And then they avoid paying taxes by keeping $3 trillion offshore. Wh when do we get to the point where they understand that putting money into the infrastructure makes money for everybody? When the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, the president, Thomas Donahue, and, and Richard Trumka from AFL-CIO agree and call upon Republicans and Democrats to work together on this, that is just, that's, that's earth shattering, really. They agree that we need to do this. The American Society of Civil Engineers said we need $2.2 trillion over the next five years just to repair the crumbling infrastructure, which does not include high-speed rail, mass transit, and renewable energy, all the things we need to free us from foreign oil and to fight climate change. But, but Mike, the thing that is most outrageous is that when the Democrats, President Obama, proposed the American Jobs Act, it was killed by Republican opposition. The Republicans wanted to see Obama fail more than they wanted to see middle class America succeed. But they, Howard, didn't you didn't it raise your eyebrows when we know, you know this for a fact, executive orders could have changed a lot of this. This have. president could say we're in an emergency situation. 
we, you know, it, it is a, it's a not only a national health issue, it's a national security issue. We need roads. We need bridges. We need to pump up uh, so much of our infrastructure that we can at least say we're competitive in a, in a world economic system. But there was no there was no executive orders, were there? And if there were, I missed them. I'm sorry. No, you're right. It was not an executive order, and but it was voted down by the Republicans in Congress, and then it, uh, the president did not follow through with executive orders. The idea was to spend $105 billion on infrastructure, which would have raised the economic output of the country by $151.2 billion. That's that big multiplier effect that they talk about that you get from investing in infrastructure. Just a quick update. $30 billion of that were gone to upgrade schools. $50 billion was for transportation, highways, highway safety, and passenger and rail and aviation. Uh, $9 billion was for inner city passenger rails and airport. And there was a $10 billion proposal for a national infrastructure bank that would provide loan projects for water, transportation, and energy. It was, Howard, it was a win-win across the totally. board for small business. And again, Congress... And I, 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 I'm glad the president tried, but I'm saying there's st some of this. If you look what Truman did, I mean, excuse me, look yeah. at what FDR did and Truman yeah. to some degree. They used executive orders to make stuff like this happen. Howard Nations, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Mike. Republicans are trying to block access to the voting booths again this year. No surprise there. But there's more to the story than just voter suppression. I have Mike Berg with me to talk about that. Michael, the Supreme Court, the Republican majority Supreme Court right now, you know, the regular suspects, took away probably one of the most important ways to make sure that everybody can vote. This is old news, and that was, you know, to basically trample on the Civil Rights Act. So now what we have is it's taking off like crazy in the states where you have places uh, like Wisconsin and Ohio and Florida saying, OK, it's a free for all, man. We're out here. We're going to do whatever we want. That free for all mentality in trying to say uh, we're, we're simply going to keep you from voting and there's nothing you can do now because the Supreme Court said that, that there's nothing you can do. That is the mentality out here right now, isn't it? It, it is. And, and what really, really compounds the problem, though, Mike, is that number one is they're, they're really trying to enrage their and get their base out, the, the, the angry white man, uh, to get out there and vote because their rights are being taken away by minorities, by giveaways. So they're really getting them really, really inflamed at the same time uh, doing everything they can to keep the people from voting. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. They're passing laws. Uh, no weekend voting, no extended hours voting. Uh, the uh, IDs, you have to have IDs. Poor people, minorities, they don't have IDs. It's really scary because it reminds me really of what Hitler did in the 30s. Well, what you're talking about there, we, you, Mike, you hit, you hit an important point when you first started this conversation, and that is that hasn't the party gotten to the point, if you listen to what they're saying, I mean, you got you got Paul you, you got Paul Ryan out there basically talking about how inner city people are worthless, taking you know lazy, worthless, taking care of the welfare, uh, you know, uh, stealing from welfare. You have Rand Paul out there saying that it's the it's the black man's fault that they that they're living in poverty. You have state you have you even had a senator. Uh, you even had a senator just a couple of weeks ago come forward with the idea of saying that, you know what, um, it, in, in America, a business owner should be able to say to a black man, we won't serve you here. That, that, and that's the status. Now, the reason I'm so captivated by the first statement that you made is, hasn't it gotten to the point where the, 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 the white voter, according to the Republican mentality, is living in, in, in a in, dancing in a slow burning house. I mean, they're just out there. They understand demographics are shifting so crazily. So now, isn't their goal to squeeze every vote they can out of their diminishing mi uh, uh, minority? Absolutely. And in fact, what they're doing is they're preying on the ignorance. We've talked about this many times the ignorance and this idea food stamps, they're going after food stamps. These people are taking money out of your pocket, they're going after welfare. They're, they're trying to light a fire to make them afraid. 
that the society that they have come grown accustomed to in the United States is going to be gone unless they go out and vote against all these people who want to give people rights. No mention of the fact that we handed $3 trillion out to incompetent boobs on Wall Street who burned down the entire economy. No mention of that. That's corporate welfare. You see, that is true corporate welfare. That's big corporate welfare that never flows down to the bottom. But, Mike, you started with this point, and I want to I work with it a little bit more because I think it's an important point. Hasn't the Republican Party gotten to the point to where they're saying, look, it's almost a South African mentality. In South Africa, they did a lot of research and they said, how is it that we can have such a small minority gain and keep control in South Africa when the ratio is one to 10,000? You know, one white person for 10,000 Africans. How do we do that? And they figured out that they scare that minority, the whites, they infuriate the minority, they arm the minority, they make that minority militant, and this is and when you talked about Berlin in 1933, that is exactly how you had the rise of fascism there. And you typically see that all the time you have fascism, a very small core of people that are so angry and they're so infuriated that they do rise to the occasion. And in this country, what's going on is at the same time they're doing that, they're also doing intimidating uh, legally and illegally. Uh, keeping the, 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 the poor, the minorities from voting. They're stopping them voting. And so it's a two-step process. Let's get our vote out. Let's scare them. Let's squeeze every vote we can out of our small minority. And yet let's intimidate and, 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 and pass laws to stop the majority from voting. It is, it is fascism. It, it, it's not it, like it. It is fascism right here in the United States of America. Well, in, in, in Wisconsin, for example, talk about the specifics you want to talk about here. Wisconsin, you had, uh, of course, Scott Walker. No surprise here. But the Republican-controlled Wisconsin Senate uh, scrapped weekend voting because right. they knew that uh, the, the numbers of what, uh, half a million people in Wisconsin voted on weekends. And they understood the vast majority of those people, 70 percent, were minority. They were people that would have voted for Democrats. So they scrapped the system. And I thought it was really interesting, the argument that they made. I mean, think about this argument, Mike. You had the people who came forward with this bill to scrap weekend voting saying, you know, it's just not fair that people in one part of the state are voting on weekends and people watching television are seeing that and they're not voting too. It was such a crazy argument that they said it was confusing to the people that were watching other people vote, that those people were just too stupid to understand it's weekend voting, and that the people who were watching the weekend voters saying, well, it's not fair to me because I can't vote. On a weekend. Those are the kinds of ridiculous arguments we're hearing coming out of Wisconsin and Scott Walker right now. We are. And what he was talking about is the, the minority vote coming out of Milwaukee, people who had to work all week, who couldn't vote during the week. And he's saying it was unfair to the people out in the farming area and the more conservative area where there's little population. It was nothing more than, than a false statement to try to keep the minorities and keep the majority, I mean, from voting. And, and not only there, but in Ohio. <clears throat> voter IDs. Um, Any, it, anywhere, it, anywhere there's a Republican governor and a Republican Senate, we're seeing this, aren't we? Right. And we have lawsuits all over the place. There's lawsuits to try to stop people from doing what they're doing in Texas, in Louisiana, in Alaska, in Montana. It's going on everywhere. Where there's a Republican governor. They're doing everything they can to keep the people from being able to get out and vote, which is the basics of this country. It, it, it's unbelievable. So if I listen to your theory, uh, I think you started this by saying it's a two-tier theory. Absolutely. A, incite the small minority, you still, the, the, the frail, stale, pale, you know, old folks, old men who are afraid of everything. I mean, I, I guess there's something to getting so damn old you just get afraid of everything. But scare, the, scare them to death and, and, and because they are your base – solidify and squeeze everything you can out of them. And then on the other side, your theory is close the polls to where people, the people who want to vote can't even get the chance to vote. Absolutely. How about gerrymandering, Mike? I mean, isn't that well, part that, of it? Right there in Colorado, isn't yeah. that part of what you fo faced in Colorado, the gerrymandering? Well, they, they've been gerrymandering for a long time trying to hold on to that. But because as what you mentioned earlier was the changing demographics of the population, that's not going to last forever. And so what they're doing now is intimidation and lying about what's going on here to, to incite the small 
uh, uh, old, angry, rich men, white men to, to come out and make sure everybody votes. I was sitting in a restaurant last night where a grandfather was just screaming at his granddaughter on these exact issues, and she was probably 14 years old, about how the giveaways and everything, and she was trying to stand up to him. And boy, she, her mother and everything just slapped her down. I want to go over and pat her on the back, but it's going on every day. We it's see it every day. Yeah. The generational issue, uh, you know, here, here's that's just part of it. But let, back to the voting, here's what's so interesting. The majority of Americans, even today, believe that it's okay for to have a voting ID card. They're, they're, they say, yeah, there's no it's problem crazy. with that. But then the 70% of them say, at the same time, do not interfere with the right to vote. Right. They Des Moines, like, yeah, that's in they, Iowa. In Des Moines Register, they did the, the in Iowa, which is not the most liberal place in the world, 71%, two-thirds of Republicans said every voter should have the right to vote. And yet we're seeing these sort of things going on. Mike, I believe in that same study you were talking about, there, there were some interesting numbers. There, there, the, the, the majority of people still believe that an ID card is a good idea, but at the same time, they say that we ought to be able to register to vote on the same day. They say that we're, there, ought to, there ought to be support for expanding early voting. They say, as a matter of fact, the vast majority say that there ought to be a, a system where people are automatically registered to vote at 18. So, so that study tells me people believe in the idea and the importance of voting. I mean, isn't that the way you read this? I do, but remember, it's that small minority that's out there trying to close the loop to try to gain and continue to gain power. I think generally most of the population agree with what this study is, which is that everyone should have the right to vote, but that doesn't mean they're still not going to do what we saw in South Africa or what they did in Nazi Germany. It's going to happen. It's happening right now, and, and I think people need to be aware of it. So, so your point, Mike, is a strong, uh, a strong uh, fearful frenzied minority can certainly maintain control in this country as we have seen with this republican held house of representatives right. so anyway yeah. mike berg uh, as usual thank you very informative and it's it's something that if we're not if people aren't paying attention to they're doing it at their own peril thank you I for agree. joining me thank you mike It's been one year since the GOP released their autopsy report where they actually acknowledged that they're facing some very serious internal problems. I have Ian Milheiser from Think Progress with me now to tell us what they've accomplished in the last year to correct the problems that the autopsy report told them were very clear. You know, Ian, it's amazing. The GOP spent a lot of money and they spent a lot of time, big effort, trying to figure out what are we dying from? And they came up with their autopsy report. It was, it was a very significant report. I mean, anybody with a brain would have looked at that and said, damn, we got some problems here. Uh, first of all, re review what the autopsy was report about and then tell us what it said and why the Republicans seem dead set on ignoring it all. Sure. I mean, the, the Republicans are in a bit of a death spiral right now, at least over the long term, because all of their voters, for, or, or most of their voters, are older white men, and older white men aren't restocking themselves. Um, you know, younger voters, younger voters tend to be more democratic. Younger voters also tend to be less white. Um, and so the problem that the GOP identified in their autopsy is they said they've got to have ways to identify, to appeal to Latinos, to appeal to African Americans, to appeal to women, and to appeal to people who don't hate gay people if they want to win presidential elections. That's what this autopsy report called for a year ago. And based on how they've been behaving for the last year, they haven't been following it too well. Okay, so leadership said, look, we just got trounced. Obama, you know, you, Obama killed. Us, mm -hmm. And they were out there saying how they were just going to destroy the, the Obama presidency in the second uh, in the second term election. They failed miserably. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody that was uh, Dick Morris, you know, made, destroyed his entire career by calling it wrong. Mm -hmm. Carl Rove should have, but he's still around out there. But the point is, they called it all wrong. And so leadership said, what went wrong? Right. So they sat down and they actually spent a lot of money trying to figure out what went wrong. And as you pointed out, it was a party of old white people that are dying away. Nobody's replacing them. 
they they were in the report they were perceived as being bigoted they were perceived as being anti-women they were perceived as being anti-immigrant they were perceived as being anti on every gender issue that that you can imagine right Mm -hmm. down the line and so they said we have a problem and then they met and they said we got to solve it tell us how the solution has worked out for them well i think the overarching problem they have is they think they can solve their problem by talking differently rather than by doing different things so, you know, several months ago, the five Republicans on the Supreme Court struck down most of the Voting Rights Act. And rather than racing to pass a fix that would reinstate m- much of this law, Republicans in Congress have largely done nothing in that regard. There's a few exceptions, while Republicans in the states are passing voter suppression laws that tar- target minority voters. You- you've got this Hobby Lobby case pending in front of the Supreme Court. And what's at stake there? is whether or not bosses, your boss is able to decide for you or a woman's boss is able to decide for them whether or not they're going to cover birth control. Um, you've got rampant anti-gay discrimination, this Arizona bill that, that almost got through on the basis of Republican lawmakers' votes. You've got Republican lawmakers, including Congress, when the Defense of Marriage Act was pending before the Supreme Court, paying millions of ta- and millions in taxpayer dollars to defend marriage discrimination in the courts. So, you know, whatever the Republicans said in their autopsy, it's not showing in their policies. They're continuing the same policies that, you know, if I were anyone other than an older white man, I wouldn't see much in there to be happy about. So, Ian, if you look at some of the literature coming out right now, it's, it's some interesting developments. The literature is saying that the Republicans at this point have gotten to the point to where they know that they have this very select white man's, old white man's party, but they're doing something really interesting. And mm-hmm. that is they're ignoring what they used to they used to call this dog whistle talk. They would talk about right. race. They would talk about welfare. They would always always attack inner city, but they would do it mm-hmm. with 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 dog whistle talk. Now we hear Rand Paul. We hear uh, we hear uh, Paul Ryan. We hear uh, virtually all of the leadership in one form or another saying it doesn't really matter anymore how badly we talk about the minorities and about the women who aren't part of our party because they feel like they're going to hold on. It's almost like it's almost like uh, uh, it's the South African analysis that in South Africa, you had a very small minority that was able to hold on by simply ginning up fear and hate in, uh, in, in this desperate attempt to hold on to that base. You almost get the attempt, the, the idea that they're, they're, they're going down that road in the way that they ignore the findings of the autopsy report. Right. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's overwhelming to me that they really don't care. Well, I started off saying that I think that the Republicans are in a long-term death spiral. And what I mean by that is that the policies that they need to appeal to a broader audience, things like immigration reform, things like you know recognizing that gay people are human beings, these are programs that have overwhelming appeal in the electorate as a whole, but they're also overwhelmingly rejected by Republican base voters. And so the problem is that as their base becomes smaller and smaller, that base is making more and more rigid demands on the party leaders to stay with the same programs that prevent them from branching out. And that's not a position you want to be in over the long haul if you're a political party. You know, they may be able to do fine in the next election because in the next election, the maps don't look so good, so good for the Democrats. But over the long haul, the problem that the Republicans have to deal with is that the voters they got now are demanding that if they're going to keep voting Republican, then the GOP has to keep doing things that are going to prevent them from bringing in new voters. Okay, and one way they do that, one way they ignore the fact that the autopsy report was so disgusting for them. They're saying, you know, you're loser party. One way they ignore coming to terms with that is that gerrymandering. Right. We change the districts to where it doesn't make any difference, that the, the candidate out there can say whatever the hell he wants to say, and it's not going to make any difference back home. They're looking at a six uh, a, a president cycle, six-year cycle for this president 
president that always goes bad in midterm. I mean, historically, right. it goes bad. You have that old, uh, angry male show up more than progressives. Progressives stay home because progressives, in their, de in, in their demented way of looking at things, say, gee whiz, the presidential election is the only thing that matters, so they stay home. You have the economy issue here, don't you? You've got an economy that people aren't sure about. The, at least the word on the street is it's still not recovered, even though it has recovered. And then you also have a, a, a president with fairly unfavorable likability at this point. So all that adds up to a problem for these folks, doesn't it? I mean, all, all of many, for the Democrats, of, those, yeah, for the Democrats. many of those things add up to a problem for the Democrats. I, I mean, in the short term, Republicans are still going to win some elections every now and then. Um, you know, looking at what the polls show now and looking at the very difficult maps that the Democrats have to defend, they're probably going to, Republicans are probably going to do pretty well in the next election. But the the problem is that over the long haul, there's only but so much you can do through appealing to the to the few voters you have and through things like gerrymandering. You know, gerrymandering is a real problem in Ohio, which is the state that Obama won. Republicans control 12 of the 16 congressional seats, and that's because of gerrymandering. Michigan, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Florida, all those states look like that. And so gerry so the report the, the report doesn't make any difference to them at this point because it's right. all short term quick results. I mean, isn't that the way they're looking at it? Short term quick results. Let's go ahead and continue packing the Supreme Court as much as we can. Maybe we can change the laws to where we can just absolute uh, uh, keep at bay this majority that doesn't seem to like us. The yep. majority, you know, which is the women and young people and uh, minorities that s just don't like us. Maybe we can keep them at bay kind of the same way they, they kept uh, the Africans at bay down in South Africa. That that single, solitary, small white minority. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, between the voter suppression laws you see in the states, the gerrymandering and then the Supreme Court striking down the core of the Voting Rights Act. You know, there's a lot of games that are that, that are going on here to try to prevent the inevitable from happening. But ultimately, if the GOP isn't able to branch out beyond older white males, there's not going to be enough older white males to sustain them, you know, no matter how many games they play. Yeah, the term is slow dancing in a burning house, isn't it? That's <laughs> kind of what we have here. Ian, thank you for joining me. As usual, great material. Uh, this is a story that we're going to talk about more and more is the midterm elections approach. Thank you for joining. Thank you. The Democratic establishment is pushing Hillary Clinton as the nominee of choice for the party in 2016. And if they succeed, it could be even more corporatist Wall Street running America. Joining me to talk about this is Farron Cousins, executive editor of the Trial Lawyer magazine. Farron, it seems like the Democrats are almost hopeless in coming up with new ideas about maybe where the party should head uh, we see them, you know, Hillary's there, and it's like it, it, she's been around for so long. You know, she's Bill Clinton's wife. She's the, the foregone conclusion that she's the only one that can win. Uh, that That is really, really poor thinking on the part of the Democrats. It, it's almost it, it's almost Republican-like, isn't it? It is. It, it, it's so Republican-like because it's not forward thinking. It's backwards thinking. Hillary Clinton has been in the national spotlight for 22 years at least at this point. And, you know, if you, if you look back at during her, her time as the first lady, her time in the Senate, her first campaign for president, you'll see that, you know, she was just as much a Wall Street Democrat as Obama has been. Her major campaign donors have always come from Wall Street. They're one of the biggest sources of, of income for her campaigns ever. She's no different than Obama. She's no different than, you know, somebody like Mary Landrau. She has no position on the environment. She is all for letting Wall Street run amok. And well, that is what the party it, wants to go to. I, I call it the Obama bot mentality. That is where Democrats say, well, he's a Democrat, she's a Democrat, and therefore uh, this is our only chance. There's no, there's no critique. There's no honesty about really what the, what the Democratic Party has become. 
we know that she's simply going to be an extension of Bill Clinton with NAFTA and CAFTA, and now it's going to be TPP. We know that she, she owes Wall Street everything. We know what the money, you know, the money is very clear. We see the history of the money coming directly from Wall Street, starting back to the Clinton days. So isn't this just an extension of Bill Clinton, an extension of Obama, where we're saying hope and change, but at the same time, we're seeing the same old thing? Unfortunately, right now in the modern Democratic Party, hope and change do not exist among the leadership. You know, when, first you have to look at the Republican Party. The Republican Party has become so extreme that Wall Street donors can't look at that and say, yeah, we'll put money behind it. So Democrats like Barack Obama, like Hillary Clinton, they move more to the center, closer to the right than the left. It and is so they get, the right and, center, and yeah. so they get that Wall Street money because Wall Street, they have to give money to somebody, the big banks, the oil companies, everybody, but they can't go to the right crazy. So now that quest for that campaign money is pushing the Democratic Party further to the center and then further to the right. We're getting away from any kind of notion of, of this, you know, Jim Hightower populism, this Bernie Sanders, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren populism, and we're moving more towards corporatism because they want the money because they think that's the only thing they can get that will make them win. Well, one big problem is the only thing the Democrats seem to focus on is the White House. I mean, if right. you think about it, they focus on the Senate, they focus on the White House, but we're really, we're getting killed in the states. You have the Democrats. Nobody listened, for example, to Howard Dean when he said, you know, we need a 50 state strategy. We've got to build from the ground up in the state. While that was going on, you had the big money, the people who make so much money, the advisors, the PR people that make so much money in the PR business of presidential campaigns and Senate campaigns. They have Democrats looking at nothing but that. And it was like if if Obama comes into power, all's going to be well. Well, while that was going on, of course, we saw that everything Obama did was destroyed. It, it, if it wasn't destroyed in Congress, it was certainly destroyed, destroyed in the state. It is that narrow, naive thinking that's killing the Democratic Party. They simply say all is riding on the same old thing. All is riding on winning the White House, and that's all the hell we care about. And you know what? If Hillary will win, everything's going to be okay because the alternative so bad, is so bad. Aren't you a little bit tired of hearing that, that we can't do any better? I am. It's like the Democratic base seems to forget that we have a separation of powers. You know, we, we do have the presidency, but we also have the Senate and the House of Representatives. We have the courts. But then come down to the state level. Come down to the city and the city level. Go, you know support a Democrat for dog catcher, school board, things like that. Work the way up from the bottom because you can enact more change on a local level, on a smaller scale than you can from the White House. And I think that's the thing that everybody overlooks. You know, they, well, they the Republicans, di Republicans didn't overlook it. Oh, Republicans had a fit. They took, matter, matter of fact, they took Howard Dean's 50 state strategy and they stole it and they used it and the same boneheaded democratic leadership that is the same old gang it's the same gang if you go back and you look at democratic leadership all the way back to bill clinton it's the same wall street crowd it's the same pr firms it's the, exactly the same people just moving around within that democratic hierarchy and so all of a sudden now we're here thinking, well, my God, the only way we can win is to have Hillary Clinton uh, run and we have to ignore people like uh, like Elizabeth Warren. We have to ignore people like Sheldon Whitehouse. We have to ignore people that probably could move the Democratic Party in the place it needs to be instead of just a recap, a retread of old Republican politics. That's what the Democrats have become. I'm an independent, so it's easier for me to say that. Well, 2016 could be a phenomenal year for the Democratic Party because any year when you don't have an incumbent running is a time to change your message. That's when you can have the most success. You can take your party in a new direction. You're not tethered to any one person. Now we can move forward and go with Hillary Clinton and stay on this, you know, Barack Obama, uh, 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 Bill Clinton corporatist path, or we can pick a, a new person. It doesn't even have to be Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. It could be somebody that we, we've never really even heard. We might not know their name today but it could be a young new 
energized figure that isn't like Obama. They're not all talk. They're out there being like Elizabeth Warren and, and, and going after the things that are screwing over Americans, like the big banks and the oil companies and, and all sorts of pharmaceutical industry. We could go yeah. on forever. Uh, you know, okay. But so, so here we are now, aren't we able to say, let's look at what this old thinking did for us. Okay. We still have corporate America housing $3 trillion in offshore banks. We still are giving corporate America $62 billion every year in subsidies. We still have a disparity, a poverty disparity in this country that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. We still have decisions that affect our national security being affected, uh, being determined by the corporate end of the, the new military industrial complex. We have all of these things right in front of us, but we say, my God, we can't do any better, so let's go with Hillary. Now, I don't know if you if you followed this story, but but Wall Street is so concerned that there might be a real challenger rise up, that they're pumping in record amounts of money into Hillary Clinton's race, and they're ignoring the 20, well, they're, they're ignoring 2014 cycle. Right. They're putting all the money into the, 20, into the, Hillary, into the Hillary race, ignoring all the, the, the reps and the senators who are running, the governors who are running, no money really to speak of going in those races. Well, and, 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 and speaking of money, what's really pathetic right now is how Hillary Clinton is pandering so, so much to the, the military contractors. When she came out a couple weeks ago and compared uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's actions oh, in, in, in Ukraine to Hitler, she's also come out and said that Obama is not being tough enough on Iran and that she does not trust Iran as far as any nuclear agreement goes. I mean, these are the same things we heard from John McCain back in 2008 that scared the hell out of us. And she is out there saying these, and she is a very real contender with a real shot at actually winning the White House. And so she's out there saying these extremist, you know, militaristic uh, uh, views. And what that's going to do is all those military contractors are going to start pumping money into her as well. And it, well, it's going to be the same saw, thing. We saw it already. They wanted a new face and they went with Obama because Obama gave a better speech. Yep. You know, basically that was it. Hope and change and we can and all that crazy nonsense that's proven to be ridiculous talk. So he's out there separating. If you remember, he separated himself from Hillary Clinton on international affairs. That's where he said, I'm different. Right. He separated himself from Hillary Clinton on Wall Street. And then, we, of course, he comes into office and that's all a lie. Right. Well, and, you know, I, I don't want to go as far as to say that we were duped by Barack Obama, but we really didn't know enough about him. We really didn't. He had no record. He hadn't taken a strong stand on the environment. He hadn't taken a strong stand on any of the important issues of the day. And so when he got into office, we, that's when we got to see who he really was. And that's when the problems arose. He, and do we know, have, but we don't have that problem with Hillary because Hillary's been out there a long time, but I don't know if we can really believe when she starts trying to say, I might be progressive, listen to the word might very carefully. Right. She, she has no record again on any of these issues, except being to the right. She's on the right on military issues. She's on the right on finance reform. She's on the right on campaign finance reform. And so she is not a Democrat at all. I mean, there's no way to look at her and say, oh yeah, you're progressive on this issue because she's not. The only reason progressives are rallying behind her or, or rallying behind whoever the party wants to throw up is because the Democratic Party is better on social issues, but you cannot build a campaign. You cannot build a party based solely on, on social, social issue. issues. Farron Cousins, thank you for joining me. Thank you. You know, there was a story that you were actually sort of part of, and I wanted to uh, talk to you about. I know that uh, about a week, week and a half ago, you were filling in for Tom Hartman on his RT program, which we should say is uh, has a, a different relationship with RT than uh, most of the programs on the network. It's uh, it's uh, completely owned by Tom. He's uh, it's more sort of a, a licensor of his uh, program than than an employee over there. Uh, so you were filling in for him on that same day that uh, RT America's Liz Wall resigned on air. And now there's a whole nother backstory to this story. Well, yeah, while we were there, it was an interesting, interesting week because, because all the, of course, the Kiev story had just started. Um, 
Liz Wall was, you know, we, everybody there had determined that she was a fraud almost immediately. Uh, very, almost no talent. I mean, let me begin with that. They, to understand the story, you, I have to say that because you have to understand she was just, you know, her role there. I mean, almost, almost without talent. But at any rate, she's there for a short period of time. And people there, were, you know, I was getting ready to go on the show the, the next night after this occurred. And I just want to know what, what had happened. And I, the story that unfolds is she's going around the studio taking pictures of everybody. She's taking pictures of, uh, you know, the most unusual things there at, at RT America. And the whole time, uh, this whole thing is being set up. The setup is that she's going to quit on the air. She's going to get all of the, you know, this woman originated with Fox News. She started with Fox News years ago. And My then, understanding is she was an intern, I think, for either Sean Hannity's uh, radio program or his television program. That's right. That's right. And those, so, so the first place she shows up after she does this stunt, and the stunt was done for a friend of hers, but uh, after she pulls off this stunt, the first place she appears, of course, is Fox News. And it, it's worth watching that interview because it shows what a dolt she is. I mean, you almost can't carry on a conversation. Almost, as a matter of fact, the first few interviews without her notes, it would have been, it was almost as if the notes were written for her about what to say when she, when she would move away from the notes, she would basically just fall apart as far as the interview response. But the point is this, the whole thing was a setup and it was, yep. it was a setup to make RT Network, RT America look bad. I can tell you, while I was there doing the show, nobody said to me, you may not say this about Russia. You may not say this about Putin. You may not say this about any of this. They, Pap, you know, go, it's your show. And so, uh, so it was to me, I was seeing firsthand that she's a liar. I mean, she's just a, a liar. Well, it was interesting because, uh, you know, a day or two before, I guess it was, Abby Martin, who is a um, uh, also a host on that program, was brilliant, brilliant, by the way, <laughs> was openly critical of uh, of the Russian invasion and uh, suffered no consequences there. Not and, at all. Uh, so it was, you know, there was a lot of skepticism about uh, this resignation on air. And like you mentioned, there. Uh, there was a piece this week by Max Blumenthal and Raina Kalik on uh, on Truth Dig, I think it was. Right, right. Uh, very where good. Very well done, by the way. It's worth reading. Yeah. They did. Yeah. I mean, I we you know people we will link to it at ringoffireradio.com. But it was fascinating because uh, the, it, it seems that much of her resignation was in fact uh, in no way spontaneous or uh, came out of the blue, but. Uh, she had been being coached by uh, a cadre of of neoconservative uh, think tankers. So yeah, talk from, about talk about that connection. Uh, I, I think this is important that listeners understand how how staged this entire thing was. Understand, this is a woman who started with Fox News, was given a chance to do a very you know very minor kind of role with RT Network. Uh, then she gets the stage and she does this for other reasons. What are the, you know, I mean, you've got there. Well, I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that the, uh, the think tank foreign policy initiative about, um, which is, which is one of those uh, neoconservative oh, think tanks. Oh, let's go bomb the hell out of everybody. Uh, it, it, indeed. Um, and it, uh, I guess about, uh, 20, 25 minutes before, uh, the resignation, they started tweeting that they were going to, that something big may happen on RT. So they clearly knew about it. Uh, and uh, an hour later, uh, after the resignation, uh, uh, there was an article at the Daily Beast by uh, uh, James Kerchick. He's a 31-year-old uh, who uh, writes for a bunch of different um uh, of papers ranging from uh, the the neoconservative commentary magazine, uh, he's written in uh, he's been reprinted in uh, Haaretz as well, uh, so he's written all over the place. But um, he is a guy who um, uh, he had earlier, I guess, in a, a couple of months ago, had gone on RT America and had um, had criticized Russia's. Um, uh, laws in regards to uh, to gay people. Uh, good for him on that. Which but, everybody did, including yes. everybody on the network that thought it was wrong, openly talked about it, and nobody said, hey, you may not do that. 
Right. Uh, and, and so that, that's what's so bothersome. But you see, this thing was spun. As a matter of fact, what was so amazing to me is the lack of background that they did on this. I mean, just uh, I, look, I can't say this enough time. Zero talent. This is a zero talent individual, this Liz Wall. But it, what, what was amazing to me is nobody did any background after the story came out to see right. what her, you know, to see what her relationship was with some of these these characters. Like well, this Kerchick, Kerchick, it turns Kerchick, out, Kerchick, is a, yeah. is a uh, senior fellow at this uh, foreign policy initiative. Uh, it was the foreign policy initiative, just to give you a sense, uh, was launched by uh, Will, uh, Bill Crystal. Uh, of course, he was the uh, w- Weekly Standard founder. Uh, it was launched by two other aides to uh, Mitt Romney, Dan Senor and Robert Kagan. These three guys are the, some of the biggest neoconservatives oh, in the country. Yeah, would, bo- would bomb Russia. You think McCain sounds like a crazy man right now? Go read what these people have to say that Liz, that Liz Wall was completely tied into, that they hustled Liz Wall or in her own mind. I, I don't know how it, how it came about, but in her own mind, she thought maybe she could get some significance. Maybe she could have 15 minutes of fame, and it turned out it was about two minutes of fame, and it was embarrassing to her. It should have been embarrassing to her during that time because she was just so deplorably bad in de- even delivering the story. So, Pap, uh, if uh, you know, we are so concerned about uh, our uh, budget in this country, uh, I know where we can find $2 trillion uh, that is due the American, uh, well, the American government. Uh, according to uh, Think Progress, it was reported, I'm sorry, um, Bloomberg News, it was reported that 307 companies now hold a combined $1.95 trillion mm. offshore. Mm. Now, understand what's going on here. Back in the 1950s, Eisenhower basically said to American corporations, we're gonna, we're go, we want to help build international markets. So we're going to encourage you to go to foreign countries and we're going to say to you that you do not have to reap, you do not have to pay taxes on your money that you earn in those foreign countries until you bring that money home. Prior to that, it was just the case that if you're an American company, you're doing business in a foreign country and you make profits, you got to pay American taxes on it. Why wouldn't you? But they said, we're going to allow you to keep that money offshore so that you can reinvest it. It'll be tax free for you. And unfortunately, what has happened over the years is that people assumed uh, it was the reverse. Not that this was a tax holiday for Americans, uh, for American corporations, but it was somehow some type of extra burden. And so back in 2005, I know you remember this, Pap, uh, George Bush pushed the American Jobs Creation Act which was a one-time repatriation of this uh, of these uh, these American profits at a, a hugely scam. discounted such, tax rate such at five percent. Such a scam. Billions came back. Not one job was created. In fact, most of the companies that brought this money back ended up uh, engaging in layoffs and just giving the money to shareholders. Well, either that or they went and bought their own stock. And, Indeed. You know, they, Buybacks, whatever it was. Yeah, but it, but they, they, they traced this. It was clear. Now, here, just you let, let's just, the average person on the street says, you know, I don't really want to pay taxes on this. I'm going to send it off to Grand Cayman Islands. And then down the road, I'm going to negotiate with the United States, and I'm going to say, if you don't let me do this, I'm, if you don't let me bring it in, I'm never going to bring it in, and, and just have it sit out there. Now, now, these are the same corporations that require our, they require the, the help of our military. They right. require the use of our roads. They require the use of our infrastructure, the taxpayers, everybody pays for. But these corporations, they think they're above all of that. N- name some of them, Sam. I don't have it in right in front of me. but I've Well, just, you've, got, number, um, really. you've got uh, Microsoft has got $76 billion offshore. Apple's got $54 billion. IBM, $52 billion. Google, $38 billion. Pfizer, $69 billion. Merck. Fifty-seven billion dollars. It goes on and on. Okay, and like so this. we say to and these, there, yeah, we say these companies, yeah, yeah, just you, you don't, you can use all of our infrastructure. You can use everything that taxpayers pay for. But you know what? You don't have to pay taxes. You can take your money to Isle of Man, leave it on Isle of Man, 
uh, Grand Cayman Islands, the Bahamas, and just bring it in when you want to. And then we'll, rather than paying what everybody else pays, we'll let you pay 3% or 5%. Right. And, and so what they're doing is they're just waiting, keeping that money offshore, waiting until they find a president who will be willing uh, exactly. to push this tax repatriation so-called holiday. But that's not a holiday. I mean, the bottom line is it's they're theft. on holiday right now. It's theft. It they're is on absolute. holiday right now, it's, and that holiday should end. And, it's absolute theft. And, and it, look, it's no different than the stories we, cover, we, we covered with the idea to where you have, if, if you go to a store and you buy something at the store, you pay tax on it, right? Every, every exchange of goods you pay tax on, but not Wall Street. We could find another $300 billion paid off over about, you know, over the next seven or eight years, $300 billion from just taxing these scams that go on on Wall Street. But no, yeah. we, don't have the, we don't have the discipline to do it. We don't have the character to do it. We, and this president, now understand, Sam, this president, by executive order, could make a lot of this stuff happen. Uh, people right. miss that. No, I got to wait for the Senate. I got to wait for no. You can do some of this with executive order. You can do executive emergency orders, and we we would never even have a discussion about gee whiz, how are we going to balance the budget? How are we going to how are we going to pay our bills? Never, ever, ever. Now I, I got to say there is a push in New York State um, to try and. Um, um, uh, create some type of financial transaction tax. Now, it's going to run into a guy like Cuomo who's never going to allow that type of stuff. But like you say, there are billions upon billions of dollars out there um, that um, that are basically, you know, when we look at other um, uh, countries, you can look at like, uh, you know, uh, we hear libertarians all the time talk about their freedom index. And they cite Hong Kong and Singapore and Australia and Switzerland about the uh, the, the, the freest economic uh, countries in the world. Well, they all have financial transaction right, taxes. Right. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.